Hi, everybody, and welcome to Thursdays at the Museum. I'm Amanda Harrison, the Community Engagement Manager with the Detroit Institute of Arts. And I'm so excited to have you joining us today for Through Her Eyes, Part Two, Women in Photography, Part One. We want you to be a part of the conversation, so please leave your thoughts and questions in the comments box on this Facebook post or log into YouTube using your Gmail account to use the public comments section. Christine Mark, our manager of volunteer development, will be asking your questions on screen to our host, trained docents Tana McPherson and Jim O'Malley. Pay special attention throughout the program because at the end, we'll have a trivia question about one of the women photographers discussed, and you'll have the opportunity to win this amazing tote bag that we'll send to your home by uh, you just emailing communityengagement at dia.org, but we'll ask that question at the very end of the program. So to get us started today, I am joined by Jim O'Malley and Tana McPherson. Please give them a warm welcome as I unmute their mics and we get us started. Hey everybody, thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Amanda. Tana and I are pleased to present to you today a talk on women photographers. We will be discussing the impact women have had in and on the role of photography as an art form and in photojournalism. In addition, we will be talking about how photography has impacted women artists. It is hoped that by viewing the photographs by women artists that we have selected for you today, that you'll become more aware of the creative contributions of women across cultures and time, and how their photographs provided a lens, quite literally, in which to explore issues of gender, politics, and culture. Photography is a relatively new art form. The earliest successful photograph was not taken until 1826, a mere 195 years ago and up until the invention of the 35 millimeter camera in the early 1900s, cameras were large, heavy, and clumsy to use. In addition, the larger early cameras often used emulsion-covered glass plates that required a long exposure time. So early on, photography was thought by many in society to require strength, patience and agility to operate. Traits not necessarily attributed to women at that time. In fact, women artists, regardless of the medium in which they chose to work, face challenges due to gender biases, not only in the art world, but through all of society. As a result, women were often denied access to formal training at art schools since they were viewed to be not smart enough to be painters or strong enough to be sculptures, or the subject matter was not appropriate for a respectable woman, such as drawing a live nude model. Early on, the choice of media for women was often relegated by men to pottery, sewing, and needlework. But photography opened doors for women in the arts that were previously closed, or at least pretty hard to open. Easy to come by, cameras were first embraced by women artists looking for a creative outlet that was not regulated, regulated to women's media, as I mentioned, such as needlework. The women we will be discussing today are some of the pioneers of art photography when the, when the camera was considered a new technology. The photographs we will be discussing were taken between 1874 and approximately 1934. Due to the impact and interest in photography in today's culture, where anyone with a cell phone is able to take a reasonably good picture, though I have to admit, I'm not in that group. Most of the pictures I take somehow end up with one of my fingers in them. Tana, and Dose and Cindy Patrick will be presenting part two of our discussion on women photographers on Thursday, September 16th. 
So if you find today's talk of interest, please plan on watching part two. And if you are a real fan of photography and are inspired from today's presentation to come down to the DIA to see these photographs in person, I have to warn you that none, none of the pieces we'll be talking about today are currently on view. Due to the fragility of the medium, especially platinum and gelatin silver prints, photographs are rarely on display at the DIA. And when they are, they are only out for a relatively short period of time. I would like to take a moment before we jump into our presentation by first thanking Maria Ketchum, who is the librarian for the DIA, for providing Tana and I uh, research material and, and our being able to make this presentation for you. And I would also like to recognize Nancy Barr, who is the curator of photography as well as photographs and prints at the DIA. The DIA is unique in that it was one of the first museums, major museums, to recognize photographs as, as a true art form. And so, and, and that the department was grew in large part due to Nancy Barr. Our first professional photographer we will be discussing today is Julia Margaret Cameron. I stress the word professional since Julia did not view her vocation as a hobby or a craft used to entertain women of leisure. Tana, would you mind telling us a little bit more about her? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So happy to be here. Great job, Jim. Um, before I get started, I just want to warn everyone, there is a possibility that, that Christine will be stepping in for me. We've had a fun morning thus far with the uh, technology. Uh, that being said, the photograph we're looking at is unique. Enid, Enid, my pronunciation, be prepared for some bad pronunciation this afternoon too, another warning for you. Enid by Julia Margaret Cameron, a Victorian era artist. Cameron is an inspiration to midlifers looking to transition from one path onto another. In 1863, Cameron received her first camera from her daughter. And she said, the daughter said, it may amuse you mother to try to photograph during your solitude of fresh water. And what the daughter meant was that the husband was away on business and Cameron's grown, Cameron's children were grown and out of the house. At the time she received that camera, she was 48 years old and she had zero study in the arts or you know photography at that time. Um, but she, she taught herself how to use the equipment and she said, from the moment I handled my lens with a tender ardor, it has become as a living thing with voice and memory and creative vigor. Like other women artists, cameras were easy to come by and photography became Cameron's link to writers, artists, and scientists such as Charles Darwin and Sir John Herschel who became spiritual and artistic advisors to Cameron. And as Jim said, while well, taken up as an amateur, she immediately viewed her activity as professional and she began copywriting, exhibiting, and publishing her work. Within 18 months of first world Holding the camera, she sold 80 prints to the Victoria and Albert Museum. Very impressive for a mid-life changer. She was one of the most important and innovative photographers of the 1800s. She broke rules left and right, and the viewers loved it. Now, you know, there were she definitely had her critics, but her photographs were deliberately out of focus. They included the scratches, smudges, and other traces of her process. Hey, Tana, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt, um, but we're having a lot of trouble with your sound right now. So I'm gonna ask Jen to jump in and maybe we'll just jump to the next piece to talk about what we have next. And maybe Tana, you can take a moment to reboot and join us momentarily. But I'm gonna ask that, that we move on and get you, our sound created. Um, and thank you to our audience for being patient as we figure this out. So, Jim, if you don't mind stepping in, we'll move on to the next piece for now. Thank you. Be happy to. In this photograph by Gertrude Kazerbeer, a young girl named Peggy stands in the space between two rooms with a woman wearing a lightweight shift leaning in towards her. Images such as this 
of a girl on the threshold of womanhood represent a theme long represented in literary and artistic traditions and speak to what many believe is a woman's most sacred duty, that of motherhood. Note the image behind the woman's head, which suggests the photographer is hitting, hinting at a Christian reference. In fact, it is an Annunciation image. But the average viewer, and you're looking at this, you probably wouldn't recognize that. It is, though, enough for you to think about it as a classical image of some sort, and perhaps there is some long-standing human truth for which, for which this image is all about. The title of the photograph, Blessed Art Thou Among Women, comes from a Bible verse describing Jesus' mother, Mary. What guidance or advice is the girl's mother offering her? The experience of receiving advice as a youth from one's mother is universal and awakens one's own memories, ideas, and emotions, and makes this photograph meaningful in its own special way. By the artist's use of light, soft focus, and delicacy, they all lend to a feeling of optimism and hope for this young girl. The photograph, though, takes on additional power when we know that the girl died not long after this image was made. Hope and anticipation for her future have been quickly changed to grief. It is a grief that no one wishes upon a parent. So let's now look at our next piece, which is our piece, from in, which is in the DIA. The woman in both photographs is Peggy's mother, a poet and close friend of Kaysabir named Agnes Lee, shown here still grieving from the loss of her child. In the photograph titled, titled The Heritage of Motherhood, she is placed in a vaguely desolate, gloomy space. It is a physical space but also represents emotional and psychological states of grief. Lee's closed eyes, upturned face, which Kaysabir darkened by hand to emphasize Agnes's emotion over her identity, her vulnerable neck, and tightly clasped hands combined to suggest a sorrowful prayer. The alignment of the horizon line just below her shoulders adds to this by making it appear as if she is pushing upward against an invisible weight. These pictorial devices are all reminiscent of those found in paintings of the Virgin of Sorrows, a fairly common representation of the mother of Jesus as she mourns her dead son. As a result, Kay Sabir's photograph becomes not a photograph of Agnes Lee, but rather the expression of the relationship of her pain and that of every mother to the suffering experienced by Jesus' mother, Mary. The illusion of Mary's suffering is reinforced by Kaysabir's hand painting of three crosses in the distance to the left of the figure. making them almost as if they're making rising above the horizon, the cross is there. Thanks, Kimmy. There are several versions of this photograph, though only the DIA's photograph strongly depicts the crosses. This photograph, like the previous one, speak to the universal traits of motherhood, from incomparable joy, to, to what sometimes feels as unbearable sorrow and suffering. So who is Gertrude K. Sabir? Could we go, thank you. She was born Gertrude Stanton in a log cabin in Fort Des Moines, Iowa, what is now Des Moines, Iowa, in 1852. During the 1859 Colorado Gold Rush, the Stantons moved to a series of boom towns where her father assayed gold and her mother sold baked goods to the miners. 
Following the sudden death of her father at the age of 12, Gertrude moved with her family to New York City, where her mother ran a boarding house. On her 22nd birthday, on the rebound from a failed romantic relationship, Gertrude married Edward Kaiserberg, a shellac importer from an aristocratic family in Germany. The marriage provided Gertrude with financial stability, a home, a son and two daughters, but less companionship than she desired. Throughout her career, she made idealistic images about the sanctity of motherhood, but had nothing good to say about marriage. Kay Sabir started her art career by enrolling at Pratt Institute as a painting major. While there, she learned about the theories of Friedrich Froebel, a scholar whose ideas about learning, play, and education led to the development of the first kindergarten. His concepts about the importance of motherhood and child development greatly influenced Kay Sabir, as seen in the many of her photographs, which emphasize the bond between mother and child. In 1895, when Gertrude's husband became seriously ill and her family finances were strained, Kay Sabir became a portrait photographer and opened a studio a photographer's studio in her home, enabling her to expand her knowledge of printing techniques. In 1898, she met Buffalo Bill Cody and due to their mutual respect, led her to taking a series of photographs of Native Americans, specifically the Sioux Nation. She eventually became one of the best known photographers in the United States with critics praising her work. In 1899, one of her pictures sold for $100, the highest price yet paid for a photograph, and a record that was rarely challenged for over 50 years. She died in 1934 at the age of 82 in her, the home of her daughter. Christine, any questions? Thank you so much, Jim. She really did have such a long and interesting mm -hmm. life. Uh, there was a comment from the group uh, about women artists. And one of our viewers today was actually uh, included in a uh, exhibition at the museum. And uh, she's very proud of it, as she should be. She should. Thank you for the comment. OK. If there isn't any other questions, I'm hoping, Tana, have you resolved your technical difficulties? Are you back with us? I can only hope. I can't make any promises. I don't know what's going on. We have powder out, power outage recently, so that may have something to do with it. I'm not sure. Let's hope. Take two. Um, sorry about that, viewers. What we are looking at now is a photograph entitled Dream by Imogen Cunningham. She lived from 1883 to 1976, and this is a gelatin, gelatin, silver print. She's been called the grandmother of photography. When asked which of her photographs was her favorite, she said, the one I'm going to make tomorrow. She was constantly striving to improve herself. One of America's first professional female artists, she's best known for her botanical photography. She was named after the heroine of Shakespeare, Cymbeline. She was born April 12, 1883 in Portland, Oregon. Her father was a spiritualist, theosophist, theosophist, free thinker and vegetarian. Her mother was a Missouri Methodist who came west to be a wife. When Imogen was three, her family joined a cooperative colony it was an experiment in communal living, so she had a very interesting upbringing. She studied photography in Germany, then came back to San Francisco and worked side along greats such as Maynard Dixon, Dorothea Lange, and Edward Weston. She moved to Seattle, where she opened a studio producing soft focus allegorical prints. Her photographic process concentrated on the science behind photography, industrial landscapes, and the human forms. The style of her photographs is called pictorialism. 
This is another style common in paintings. And what I was going to say about Cameron before, she modeled her painting off of, or she mo modeled her photographic style after paintings from the 15th century. And a lot of the times this was common practice amongst photographers who were devotees of aestheticism the artistic principles that governed painting, they tried to bring that through into their photographs. And so there was an emphasis on the beauty of the subject matter, the tonality and the composition, rather than just documenting reality for kind of utilitarian or memorialization purposes. And it's said that Imogen used this as a means to explore boundaries and identities. She used this technique in order to explore boundaries and identity. And um, Imogen, she was quite the woman. She created artistic scandal by taking nude pictures of her husband frolicking in the woods. And what's funny about that to me is that the scandal was that the woman was the one who was taking the picture instead of the one being um, the subject in the picture. And the, ma the man was the nude and the woman was the one taking the pictures. In the 1920s, she started taking close-ups of sharply detailed pictures of plants. I think we have one. There we go. Isn't that beautiful? Let's just take a moment to look at that. That's magnolia blossom. And I believe that's also in our collection. Imogen spent two years photographing the magnolia flower. And she captured the flowers in full bloom. And some say that in doing so, she made the freshness of the pictures and the flowers timeless. She explores the textures of the petals and she idealizes the form of the flower. It's very sensuous. Makes me think of Georgia O'Keeffe. In 1931, Imogen also photographed Frida Kahlo. I think we have a copy of that. There we go. And we also have um, a portrait of the artist herself. She was an influential member of F64, a group of photographers that included Ansel Adams and Willard Van Dyke. They were focused on showcasing the sensuous in their work. And she often took pictures of museum musicians at their hands. Uh, in 1945, Ansel Adams asked her to take a position at the California School of Fine Arts. She became one of the first members of their photography department. She had solo exhibitions in the Dallas Art Museum and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Her works are held by the National Gallery of Art in DC, Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Photography, and many, many others were super lucky to have her in the DIA. In Dream, the original uh, photograph, there we go, Imogen uses a soft focus technique to create an ethereal scene. Dream is the image that defined Cunningham's work, and for her, defined photography as an art form by a simple and direct presentation through purely photographic methods. Christine, are there any questions? Not at this time, Tana. Thank you. Well, I guess we'll move on to the next. Thank you. Tana, Back you before, you, before you leave us for a second, what do you see when you look at this photograph? Okay. Um, one of the words that come to mind is mask. Another that comes to mind is androgyny. And I guess the third that comes to mind is reflection. Mm-hmm. And the reflection is because of the orb, that sphere there, creating a mirror image of the viewer possibly seeing themselves in it. Why mask, though? Oh, why mask? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, to me, the, the facial paint looks like the um, paint that's used on a mine. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the photographer is... Um, is, 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 is named Claude Caja. And Claude Caja, his, was, whose original name was Lucy Schwab, was born in Nuance, France in 1894. 
They were a French writer, photographer, surrealist, and performance artist who was largely written out of art history until 1896 when their photographs were included in an exhibition of surrealist photography. Surrealism was the leading avant-garde movement of the 1930s. They were known for their self-portraits. Claude Caja was known for their self-portraits that show them as ambiguously gendered. Claude was born into an affluent family. Because their mother suffered from mental illness, they were sent to live with their grandmother. Though their mother was not Jewish, Caja was Jewish on their father's side, and they became, or Claude became exposed to anti-Semitism from an early age. Their father sent them to school in Surrey, England at the age of 13 for two years in an effort to protect them. In 1909, they returned to Nuance and met Marcel Moore, who would eventually become not only their stepsister, but also their lifelong companion and collaborator. Moore's mother and Kaha's father married in 1917, and the two moved in together. It is thought that Kaha took their first self-portrait around the age of 19, launching a lifelong obsession with examining gender, using themselves as the subject. Their use of mirrors or mirror balls, as seen in this piece, is symbolic of their own reflection as they explored their identity. By the age of 20, 23, Lucy Schwab had adopted the pen name Claude Caja. In taking a gender neutral forename and by shaving their head, as they did often in the late 1910s, Caja actively and outwardly rejected social construction of gender and sexual identity. In their self portraits, they presented themselves sometimes as a man, sometimes as a woman, sometimes thoroughly androgynous, and sometimes so heavily made up and costumed that it was impossible to determine their persona's gender. In response to the Nazi party's rise to power, Caja and Moore fled Paris permanently in 1938 for Jersey, a British-held island in the English Channel where they had spent their summers since 1922. In 1940, however, the Nazis invaded Jersey. Caja and Moore employ, employed a subversive avant-garde art practice as a form of resistance. For example, they created anti-nationalist leaflets that mocked Nazi ideology and distributed them throughout the island of Jersey. Their activities were discovered in 1944. And though they were not leaders of a large scale resistance movement, as the Nazis believed, the two were imprisoned and sentenced to death for undermining Nazi authority and much of their property, including their art, was confiscated. They were saved when the island was liberated in 1945. A photo of Kaha taken after the liberation, shows them defiantly clenching a Nazi military badge in their teeth. Kaha and Moore remained in Jersey and continued to collaborate into Kaha's death at the age of 60, having never fully recovered from the effects that imprisonment had had on their health. Moore inherited Claude's possessions and art but Caja's legacy was nearly lost when Moore committed suicide in 1972 and all of Caja's artwork was auctioned off. While few of Caja's writings have been translated into from French, their examination of gender and sexuality were well ahead of their time in according, according to numerous biographers and critics. Christine, any questions? Thank you for that, Jim. 
Uh, no, actually, we don't have any questions on this artist, so I think we can move on. Good. I'm hoping, uh, Tana, how's your how's your sound or technical connection working? I believe not very well. Um. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wait. Hold on. So, if you, um, if that's if it's okay with everyone. Why don't we uh, move on to the next piece, my next piece? And we'll allow Tana some time. There we are. Great. The name of this piece is Mirror, Me in Mirror with Leica. And it was photographed by photographer Ilse Bing, once set, who once said about this photograph, I felt that the camera grew an extension of my eyes and moved with me. One of her best known photographs, a self portrait taken in a mirror, seems to illustrate this thought. It shows both a frontal view of Bing peering from behind her camera and a profile view that allows us to see more of her face and camera. This image, which highlights the small which highlights the small camera on a tripod, a new and revolutionary 35 millimeter single lens camera introduced in 1926, which enabled photographers to capture fast moving events and revolutionize the way photographers were able to shoot photographs. Since the camera was able to take 36 shots per roll of film, Bing was the first professional photographer to wholeheartedly adopt this camera, which incurred spontaneity, experimentation, and boldness. Bing was soon dubbed by a critic as the queen of the Leica for the inventiveness and originality she brought to this innovative technology. Bing was born into a comfortable Jewish family in Frankfurt, Germany in 1899. As a child, her education was rich in music and art and her intellectual development was encouraged. For her 14th birthday, Kimmy, could you switch to the next slide? She received as a present a camera and this photograph is, is reported as the very first photograph she took with it or her very first photograph as a photographer. And it, um, the camera th that she's using was a simple Kodak box camera, a camera being advertised at the time as so simple, even a child could use it. It's fascinating that one of her first photographs was a self-portrait taken by shooting her reflection in a mirror. This is a format that she would return to throughout her career. Thank you. For the next 15 years, Bing would remain just an occasional snap shooter. In her late 20s, Bing was working on her doctorate in art history and needed a better camera to take some architectural photographs for her dissertation. With her newfound love of photography, though, she gave up on her thesis to concentrate on photography. She began her career producing photographic essays for German magazines in the late 1920s. Inspired by the photographer Florence Henry, she moved to Paris in 1930 at the age of 31. There, she developed a successful career as an avant-garde and fashion photographer. Daringly surreal, even in her commercial work, she brought a fresh approach to fashion assignment for Harper's Bazaar. For other magazines, Bing captured the nightlife, amusements, and unique characteristics of the city of Paris, which she quickly fell in love with by producing images that cross the boundary between commercial work and art. Her photographs were included in exhibitions at the Louvre and at the New York Museum of Modern Art. Upon the Nazi invasion of France in 1940, Bing and her husband, both German Jews, were interned in separate camps in the south of France 
But in June 1941, with the help of the fashion editor of Harper's Bazaar, they were able to obtain visas and migrate to New York City. In New York, she struggled to establish an equally successful career in a new culture and amid the constraints of the war years. In the late 1950s, Bing decided to quit photography, saying, I wanted to make mobility felt and I needed another medium, so I turned to poetry. My poems are called snapshots without a camera. So she reasoned, I am always a photographer, whatever I do. In the mid 1970s, a renewed fascination with 1930s modernism and a newfound interest in woman artists sparked Bing's rediscovery. Enthusiasm for her work has remained high over the ensuing decades, resulting in several retros retrospective exhibitions of her work. Christine, any questions? Hi, Jim, and thank you. That like a camera really did change Elsa Bing's life, didn't, didn't it? And so many photographers. And the, just with the change, you know, when she was able to look through the camera, she was immediately able to see the photograph she was taking versus the old clumsy camera boxes where they would tip, you know, put a cover on and the emulsion and the ability to quickly shoot off picture after picture versus the line, long time exposure needed when an emulsion was put onto a glass plate. The 35 millimeter did revolutionize photography as an art. Absolutely. The ease of carrying it and the mm -hmm. small size. Right. And, uh, and that's kind of emphasized here in her self portrait, isn't it? Right. You can it see is. How you can see the whole like a camera in the mirror right. and how much different that was than um, perhaps, you know, what Cameron had to deal with. Exactly, exactly. And it, and it really shows that the camera and her are really, she thinks of them as one of the same. She views herself really, her identity through that lens of that like a camera. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Hey, no problem. Tana. You're back. <laughs> I'm back. Third time's a charm. Okay. Oh, totally. great. Oh, good, good. I'm so glad to hear that. And the treat for the audience is, if I go away, you get to hear my pizzas done by Christine, who is so knowledgeable about all of them. It is a delight mm -hmm. to listen to her. So uh, maybe you you prepared a special <laughs> program today, Tana, and it's your day. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. And on that note, we're going to talk about Dora Marr and her piece, Surrealist Woman. This is a gelatin silver print. Dora Marr was born in Paris, spent her early years in Buenos Aires before going back to study and spent her adult years in Paris. She lived from 1907 to 1997. She was a prominent photographer in the Surrealist movement. And for those who don't know or don't remember or want a refresher, Surrealism was one of the biggest art movements in Paris in the 30s. It aimed to be transgressive, combining mystery, eroticism, political engagement, as well as a strong emphasis on individual freedom. So in addition to being a prominent photographer, Marr was also a painter. But unfortunately, she was known mostly as Picasso's uh, inspiration and lover. There you go. Those are some uh, paintings of Picasso's that were inspired by Marr. She was the subject in his 1937 series, Weeping Women, Weeping Women, which we have, Weeping Woman, which we have on the left, and Girl Reading, which we, no, I'm sorry. Weeping Woman is on the right and Girl Reading is on the left. There we go. Um, she also documented Picasso's painting of Guernica, which was a huge project at the time, not just because of Picasso's prestige, but also because the piece was large and capturing it all required adept knowledge of photography. Once when asked about her own work, she said, I must dwell apart in the desert. I'm still too famous as Picasso's mistress to be accepted as a painter. Uh, 
It wasn't until 2019 when the Tate Modern in London featured a large exhibition of her work that she got her own big show. And that uh, featured 400 pieces. She started her art study studies at, I'm not gonna say this properly, Union Centrale des Arts Décoratifs, and then she switched to the Ecole, Technique de Photography <laughs> and Cinematography. She started off as a painter, and in 1927, she switched her focus to photography for a while. Eventually, she did go back to painting, and switching, toggling back and forth between the two allowed her to hone her technical skills and develop a wider ranging aesthetic. This was also a practical move because, as Jim has mentioned, there were less obstacles for entry into photography. Painting was competitive in Paris, and even more so for a woman. Photography wasn't seen as preeminent as sculpture or painting, so there was more room for women. And she produced a wide range of work from high-end fashion photographs, artful advertising pictures, flattering studio portraits, figure studies, softcore pornography for a charm magazine, gritty street scenes, documentary shots, politically inflected images, rigorous formal compositions, and the complex, disturbing, and beautifully crafted surrealist photo montages that are her most memorable creations. So in the surrealist woman photograph that we have, you can see how her painterly background comes through in the photograph. The artistry of the woman's makeup and the lighting almost make the viewer question whether or not this isn't a collage of a painting or, you know, a collage of painting and photography or possibly a mannequin. mannequin. It's a low angle shot, which was inventive for the time. And you can see the Caravaggio style chiaroscuro in the shadow from the background, foreground, right to left evident in her style. So do we have any questions, Christine, about Dora Mar? Picasso's mistress extraordinaire? I'm not hearing any questions. I'm not hearing anything though. Did I just lose everyone again? You're still with us, Tana. <laughs> I was talking no. into a void. Okay, so I'm sorry. Okay. You know, now it was my turn for for uh, for my video to drop. <laughs> oh, we're uh, so no, much we fun have today. some uh, viewers though saying that they're enjoying from Colorado. Um, Pamela says she absolutely loves this. I'm so okay. glad because our viewers need patience today with our presentation. Yes. Uh, yes, thank and you. Yeah, another person said that they really love all these pictures and uh, she's still thinking about the one in the mirror. Um, so uh, yeah, that that was um, that was a, the Ilsa Bing. It, it was, mm -hmm. it's really uh, quite striking. So um, thank you. And I think we're ready to go on. You sound much better, Tana, by the way. Oh, great. Yes, and thanks for the patience, everyone. Okay, Jim, take it away. Oh, okay. You want to talk about, want me to talk about this piece? Okay. No problem. Go back. Okay. Nope. One more. Nope. 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 I've done that. You want to talk? Uh, that's one. I'll talk. Great. We're looking at the nursery of the ammo truck manufacturing plant in Soviet Russia. Women who worked in the factory needed care for their babies during their work shifts. The Ammo Automobile Factory was actually a major truck and heavy equipment manufacturer that produced armored cars for Soviet leaders, along with buses and armored fighting vehicles. During 1930-31, Margaret Bork White made two trips to Russia to photograph its burgeoning industry and its people becoming the first foreign photographer to take pictures of Russian industry. Margaret Bork White lived the life most of us only dream about. She was a woman of many firsts. She was the first photographer for Fortune magazine 
And as I just mentioned, the first Western professional photographer permitted into the Soviet Union. She was Life Magazine's first female photographer and the first female war correspondent credentialed and able to work in combat zones during World War II. And for all you Wolverine fans, she even attended the University of Michigan from 1923 through 1925, where she studied herpetology of all things. It's the study of reptiles and amphibians. She also, while she was at, in Ann Arbor, took photographs for the yearbook, The Michigansian, and joined Alpha Omicron Pi sorority. It was also at U of M that she met and married Everett Chappie Chapman. How would you like that for a name? Chappie Chapman. He was a graduate student in electrical engineering, though the marriage only lasted two years. Margaret also attended, are you ready? Columbia, Rutgers, Case Western Reserve, Purdue, and Cornell. While attending these various universities, she took up photography, first as a hobby, and then after leaving Cornell, she, where she did get her bachelor's degree, she moved to New York City as a professional freelance photographer. She began her career in 1927 at the age of 23 as an industrial and architectural photographer. She soon gained a reputation for originality. And in 1929, the publisher, Henry Luce, hired her for his new Fortune magazine. In 1930, Fortune sent Margaret to photograph the Krupp Ironworks in Germany, and she continued on her own to photograph the first five-year plan in the Soviet Union. She became one of the first of four staff photographers for Life magazine when it began its publication in 1936. And her series of photographs of Montana's Fort Peck Dam was featured on the cover and used as the main story of Life magazine's very first issue. Throughout the 1930s, Margaret went on assignments to create photo essays in Germany and the Soviet Union, as well as the Dust Bowl of the American Midwest. Those experiences allowed her to refine her dramatic style. Those projects also enabled her to introduce people and social issues as subjects into her work as she developed a more compassionate humanitarian approach to her art. In 1935, Margaret met the Southern novelist Erskine Caldwell, to whom she was married from 1939 to 1942. The couple collaborated on three illustrated books. When the United States entered into World War II, she began working directly with the U.S. Armed Forces, covering the war for Life magazine. While crossing the Atlantic to North Africa, her transport ship was torpedoed and sunk. But Margaret survived the ship's sinking to cover the bitter daily struggle of the Allied infantrymen in the Italian campaign. She then covered the siege of Moscow, which she wrote about in her book, Shooting the Russian War. Toward the end of the war, she crossed the Rhine into Germany with George S. Patton's Third Army troops. Her photographs of the emancipated inmates of concentration camps and of the corpses in gas chambers stunned and shocked the world. If that wasn't enough, after World War II, Margaret traveled to India to photograph Mohandas Gandhi and record the mass migration caused by the division of the Indian subcontinent into Hindu India and Muslim Pakistan. And if that wasn't enough, during the Korean War, she worked as a war correspondent and traveled with South Korean troops. Stricken with Parkinson's disease in 1952, at the age of 48, 
Margaret continued to photograph and write and publish several books on her work, as well as her autobiography, Portrait of Myself. She retired from Life magazine in 1969 and passed away from Parkinson's in 1971 at what I believe the young age of 67. Quite a life. Christine, any questions? No, but my goodness, in 67 years, she sure did cover the globe, didn't, didn't she? she? Mm -hmm. um, she seemed yeah. to be in all the hot spots and amazing life for a, a young woman um, out on her own. Uh, what Truly a career incredible. Career. Absolutely. I love this incredible. photograph too. It just sparkles. Doesn't it just mm -hmm. show her, her personality? But for a woman of the 20th century who was born in 1904, uh, what an amazing story. It she is. just seemed to to break through all of those glass ceilings when it came she to- She broke through so you know, many barriers. Yeah, when it came, you know, women were so limited and she wasn't just taking no for an answer, it sounds like, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really a, a suffragette in her own time. Right. Uh, all right, uh, we have one more piece and I think uh, Tana, uh, We'll go back to the Bernie Sabbath. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Let's do okay, it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, guys. What we're looking at right now is New York at Night by Berenice Abbott. She's, Amer she's an American photographer. She lived from 1898 to 1991. The other photographers I discussed were known for their aesthetic approach to photography, but Berenice Abbott was known for her documentary approach to photography. She believed her purpose was to capture as realistically as possible what was right in front of her. She strove to create objective photographs that stood on their own merit rather than referencing other art forms. She's quoted as saying, photography can never grow up if it imitates some other medium. It has to walk alone, it has to be itself. She spent a term at the Ohio State University in Columbus and then studied sculpture independently in New York from 1918 to 1921, where she met Marcel Duchamp and Man Ray. She left the USA for Paris in 1921, where she studied at the, I'm gonna say this wrong, Académie de la Grande Chamière. I studied Spanish, not French. Before attending the Kunstkuhl in Berlin for less than a year in 1923. Apologies for that mispronunciation. Berenice Abbott is best known for her striking black and white photographs of New York City buildings, of which we have one coming up momentarily. She photographed, the, there we go, she photographed these buildings as though taking portraits. In the 1920s, she served as a darkroom assistant to Man Ray in Paris. She'd modeled for him earlier in New York and uh, while modeling, she encountered such leading cultural voices of the day as James Joyce, Max Ernst, and Edna St. Vincent Millay. Her first one-woman show at the Gallery La Sacre du Printemps in Paris in 1926 was devoted to portraits of avant-garde personalities such as Marcel Duchamp, Jean Cocteau, James Joyce, and André Guidé. She continued to take portraits until leaving Paris in 1929. Uh, she took portraits of James Joyce, and after Atre's death in 1927, she bought most of his negatives and prints in 1928, and in 1929, she returned to New York, which is where she took the picture that we are able to look at today. She'd found inspiration in the Parisian streetscapes of Eugene Atre, an influence that would carry into changing New York. This is part of that series from 1935 to 1938. And her major body of work for the Works Progress Administration Federal Art Project. There was a very, in, this was a very interesting time when this photograph was taken, um, New York was going through all kinds of changes. You had skyscrapers coming up and you had old buildings that were being torn down. The ethnic compositions of neighborhoods was changing and Abbott captured a lot of this. All of her photographs demonstrate the strength all of these photographs demonstrate the strength and range of women photographers in the eight, from the 1800s until now. Um, 
And that is all that I have for this particular piece. Do we have any questions? We did have a question in regard to uh, whether we have any uh, women of color, African-American women in this um, section of the presentation. And I just wanted to note that in Women Photographers Part 2, uh, we do, but not in the first part. Um, we, this, we're going chronologically starting in the 1800s. And I, I did mention to my colleagues that if the DIA owns uh, photographs of women photographers of, of color from the early 1900s, um, I haven't seen them, but I really like the suggestion to go look for some. So um, that is something that, uh, that, that I'm going to do after this presentation to see if we have any from the late 1800s to the you know, mid 1900s. Um, I haven't seen any, but we certainly do um, after 1950 and uh, they will be highlighted in the uh, Women Photographers Part 2. Great question. Thank you for asking. Um, so if we don't have any other questions or comments, I think I will close. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, well, we hope you enjoyed this afternoon's show. Um, our next presentation, as Christine mentioned, part two is coming in September. That's women in photography. Um, we also have two more photography exhibitions coming up. Black is Beautiful in the fall. I believe that's October 8th. We have the new Black Vanguard in December. And even closer than that, this is not photography, but we have a free movie coming up next week, Steamboat Bill Jr. And following the film, there's going to be a discussion with Elliot. Um, and of course, we invite you all to come down and see everything in person. Then you won't have to deal with any technical delays. Um, the hours of operation are 9 to 4, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, Saturday and Day from 10 to 5. You can per um, get your reservation tickets using the reservation system at dia.org. And tickets are free to residents of the Tri-County area. So before we go, we have a trivia question. Amanda mentioned a trivia question in the beginning. And the winner of the trivia question is going to receive that fantastic tote bag for Tom Phenomenal Women. So the trivia question is, which woman photographer was closely related to Pablo Picasso? First person to answer needs to send their name, phone number, and address to communityengagement at dia.org. There you go. There is the address. And I'll, I'll ask the question more, one more time. Which woman photographer was closely related to Pablo Picasso? Hello? Thank you, Tana. And thank you for everyone watching at home. We'll just ask that you uh, it looks like we have some winners announced already. I will drop that email address in the chat again. And thank you so much, everyone, for watching. We hope to see you again next week.